uh, and I'm proud to say the College of Humanities and Development of the China Agricultural University. Um, well, not much time. First of all, uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here and to com help commemorate the uh, 20th anniversary of class. I mean, I've been fortunate to be involved in one way and another with PLAS over most of those uh, 20 years. Uh, the one way or another has not uh, sadly uh, included bringing in funding as uh, Ian Schoons does so well. Um, uh, but I, when Terry Byers and I established a new journal of agrarian change in 2001, it's a source of satisfaction that we have been able to publish a number of authors and important papers and debates coming out of the class. Okay, so in relation to the question for this, um, this session, I'm going to trump Bridget and go back to the 19th century. Um, <laughs> I think there are two, oh, this is very schematic, you understand. I think there are two basic models of agrarian class formation in capitalism. One is Marx's model, primitive accumulation, accumulation from above, if you like, to generalize it. Um, and that is still very much alive. In fact, it's had a big comeback, uh, partly thanks to David Harvey, accumulation by dispossession is an adaptation, for better or worse, of what Marx meant by primitive accumulation. The other one is Lenin. Development of capitalism in Russia is a growing class formation through differentiation of farmers and accumulation from below. Now, I think both of these still have a strong resonance for um, agrarian questions and their politics today. But the picture today is more complex. Obviously, capitalism has developed globally. Uh, it, in such a large uh, fashion since uh, the time of Marx and of Lenin. One of the complications, or one of the new complexities, is where does corporate agribusiness feed into this? And this has been a major preoccupation at the, at the BCAS conference, and rightly so. And it seems to me that the sorts of questions raised about corporate agribusiness now are span both those forms of uh, accumulation from above and accumulation from below. Um, also spanning them is the question of, uh, or, or the presence of various agrarian social movements because in different ways and different places they take on, confront both accumulation from above, whether it's straightforward dispossession of land or whether that uh, is, is the, the increasing imposition of corporate agribusiness and certain ways of farming inputs and so on and, and certain ways of distributing what's produced that's downstream of farming, marketing, um, supermarkets, big food processing companies and all the rest of it. And it seems to me though that the social movements actually operate, again this is very schematic, in kind of two modalities against the accumulation from above it's easier to propose a very militant stance uh, this is what Harriet Friedman calls the warrior stance and this is what I would call type 1 resistance and it's difficult, how can you not be sympathetic to this when land is being grabbed uh, water is being depleted soils are being uh, polluted uh, and all the rest of it. That seems to me much more straightforward because we know that accumulation from above in whatever form, whether it's, it, it's private equity funds grabbing land or whether it's, uh, it, it, it's multinational, transnational uh, agribusiness corporations extending their reach, we know they're all real bastards and we hate them, and so we're all against them. When it comes to accumulation from below, then it seems to me it starts getting complicated. And I resist the temptation. I don't have time anyway to engage in a polemic with my good friend uh, Sergio Schneider about family farming and so on. 
Um, but it seems to me that what that involves and the idea of an alternative that can be constructed and is being constructed in the here and now involves a very different kind of politics and a different notion of resistance, which is more in line with Harriet Friedman's notion of a builder approach rather than the warrior approach. And what is it building? It's seeking to build an alternative within capitalism. Now, I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just making an observation. I don't have a, I don't have a problem with that intrinsically, but I do think there's a problem if one doesn't face up to it. And so the politics there is a kind of politics of the market question, if you like, again, to put it schematically. How do you organize forms of politics that open up avenues, improve uh, prospects and so on for commodity producers who are not big capitalists or big corporate commodity producers. But commodity producers, they are, without a doubt. And that's where I'm happy. Well, I admire the work of Ian and his team on Zimbabwe and what they've shown about changes in agrarian production and differentiation since the, the fast-track uh, land reform there. Um, and I'm surprised, I think it was Mark Vesherif who said that who asked how, how can Ian call these fairly robust, innovative, dynamic, petty commodity producers, how can he call them progressive? They seem to me to be exactly the sort of person you were, uh, people that you were saying are doing such a great job in Tanzania in your presentation the other day. I mean, these are not subsistence peasants, these are not, you know, engaged in community projects, they are some of them, probably a minority, making their way forward through the market. So I don't have either an intrinsic problem with that. But if we start to think about that in terms of differentiation, I think accumulation from below is, in most circumstances, likely to be successful for only a minority. Uh, over time, it may... Uh, intensify. So that raises the question of whether an alternative, a small or family farmer alternative uh, within capitalism and one that tries to push back the grip of agribusiness and, and the grip of big, big market forces, whether that can encompass and is likely to encompass all small farmers. Well, my answer obviously is as partly a rhetorical question, is absolutely not. Um, and it will vary enormously um, from place to place. I mean, I read with great interest Sergio's work on the development of an alternative um, in Brazil. And uh, I'm very pleased when I read in his papers that under some of its programs, the Brazilian government donates tractors to thousands of small farmers, whereas, of course, other branches of the alternative movement, tractors are anathema to them, giving tractors to small farmers to be more efficient in some sense or another is anathema. So there's a lot of um, potential confusion here. However, there is a question which was raised, I think this will be my last point, Neva, raised in different ways by... Sergio Sam by Bridget, which is the question of unity and unity as the basis of effective politics. Now, it seems to me problematic if you kind of conjure an image of unity from certain premises. And I think this is what happens in, uh, in some of the, the Via Campesina discourse. Uh, and when people say, peasant is a political category, not an analytic. It's not a category about how people produce their livelihoods or part of their livelihoods from working the land. It's a political category. And so, you know, if, if I was a Via Campus senior supporter or champion, which I'm not, by the way, uh, I could call myself a peasant because I would be identifying with that political category. So what they're saying is that most farmers, and indeed in some formulations, all farmers, including 
American family farmers and Canadian family farmers with the 1,000 hectares, 2,000 hectares, and using only family labor because they have big machines, which is not very agroecological, or they rent in specialized farm services, you know, that they should be, that we're, we're all together in, in this. And um, it may be that failing to grapple with this, with this, you know, in a sense, horrible issue of differentiation and how it might affect the prospects of unity, or even if not unity, some forms of alliances, might itself partly explain why uh, these movements are politically frail, why they haven't got so far, which was also an issue uh, that, um, that Sergio raised. And he's coming from a country which has given us, together with Via Campesina, the most emblematic you know, rural movement, social movement of this kind, namely the MST. So these are uh, questions that I would bring forward from the middle late 19th century to today, recast them in, in today's conditions, but I think the answer, and I think all three of us in different ways on this panel have suggested that this, is that you know, there are, ain't no easy answers or formulae to, um, to the question of, of building movements that achieve some sort of unity and, and, and thence, we hope, some, some sort of um, momentum uh, and power. In changing things in this uh, truly horrible world that is uh, created by corporate capital, finance capital, and so on.